Clare knew that she loved him, every curve of her form showed that. But he did not know, at this time, the full depth of her devotion, its single-mindedness, its meekness. What long-suffering it guaranteed, what honesty, what endurance, what good faith! As they came out of church the ringers swung the bells off their rests, and a modest peal of three notes broke forth. That limited amount of expression having been deemed sufficient by the church builders for the joys of such a small parish. Passing by the tower with her husband on the path to the gate, she could feel the vibrant air humming round them from the louvered belfry in a circle of sound, and it matched the highly charged mental atmosphere in which she was living. This condition of mind, wherein she felt glorified by an irradiation not her own, like the angel whom St. John saw in the sun, lasted till the sound of the church bells had died away, and the emotions of the wedding service had calmed down. Her eyes could dwell upon details more clearly now, and Mr. and Mrs. Crick, and Mr. and Mrs. Crick, having directed their own gig to be sent for them, to leave the carriage to the young people, she observed the build and character of that conveyance for the first time. Sitting in silence she regarded it long. "'I fancy you seem oppressed, Tessie,' said Clare. "'Yes,' she answered, putting her hand to her brow. "'I tremble at many things. It is all so serious, Angel. Among other things I seem to have seen this carriage before, and to be well acquainted with it. It is very odd. I must have seen it in a dream." "'Oh, you have heard the legend of the d'Urberville coach, that well-known superstition of this county about your family, when they were very popular here, and this lumbering old thing reminds you of it.' "'I have never heard of it, to my knowledge,' said she. "'What is the legend? May I know it?' "'Well, I would rather not tell it in detail just now. Uh, a certain d'Urberville of the sixteenth or seventeenth century committed a dreadful crime in his family coach, and since that time members of the family see or hear the old coach whenever—but um, But I'll tell you another day. It is rather gloomy. Evidently some dim knowledge of it has brought back to your mind by the sight of this venerable caravan." "'I don't remember hearing it before,' she murmured. Is it when we are going to die, Angel, that members of my family see it, or is it when we have committed a crime?" "'Now, Tess!' He silenced her by a kiss. By the time they reached home she was contrite and spiritless. She was Mrs. Angel Clare indeed, but had she any moral right to the name? Was she not more truly Mrs. Alexander d'Urberville? Could intensity of love justify what might be considered in upright souls as culpable reticence? She knew not what was expected of women in such cases, and she had no counsellor. However, when she found herself alone in her room for a few minutes, the last day on which she was ever to enter it, she knelt down and prayed. She tried to pray to God, but it was her husband who really had her supplication. Her idolatry of this man was such that she herself almost feared it to be ill-omened. She was conscious of the notion, expressed by Friar Lawrence, "'These violent delights have violent ends.' It might be too desperate for human conditions, too rank, too wild, too deadly. "'Oh, my love, my love, why do I love you so?' she whispered there alone for she you love is not my real self, but one in my image, the one I might have been." Afternoon came, and with it the hour for departure. They had decided to fulfil the plan of going for a few days to the lodging in the old farmhouse near Wellbridge Mill, at which he meant to reside during his investigation of flower processes. At two o'clock there was nothing left to do but to start. All the servantry of the dairy were standing in the red brick entry to see them go out, the dairyman and his wife following to the door. 
Tess saw her three chambermates in a row against the wall, pensively inclining their heads. She had much questioned if they would appear at the parting moment, but there they were, stoical and staunch to the last. She knew why the delicate Retty looked so fragile, and is so tragically sorrowful, and Marian so blank and she forgot her own dogging shadow for a moment in contemplating theirs. She impulsively whispered to him, "'Will you kiss em all once, poor things, for the first and last time?' Clare had not the least objection to such a farewell formality, which was all that it was to him, and as he passed them he kissed them in succession where they stood, saying good-bye to each as he did so. When they reached the door, Tess femininely glanced back to discern the effect of that kiss of charity. There was no triumph in her glance, as there might have been. If there had, it would have disappeared when she saw how moved the girls all were. The kiss had obviously done harm by awakening feelings they were trying to subdue. Of all this Clare was unconscious. Passing on to the wicket-gate he shook hands with the dairyman and his wife, and expressed his last thanks to them for their attentions, after which there was a moment of silence before they moved off. It was interrupted by the crowing of a cock. The white one with the rose comb had come and settled on the palings in front of the house, within a few yards of them, and his notes thrilled their ears through, dwindling away like echoes down a valley of rocks. Oh, said Mrs. Crick, an afternoon crow. Two men were standing by the yard gate holding it open. That's bad, one murmured to the other, not thinking that the words could be heard by the group at the door wicket. The cock crew again, straight towards Clare. Well, said the dairyman. I don't like to hear him, said Tess to her husband. Tell the man to drive it away. Good boy, good boy. The cock crew again. Hoosh, just you be off, sir, or I'll twist your neck, said the dairyman with some irritation, turning to the bird and driving him away. And his wife, as they went indoors, now to think of that just to-day. I've not heard his crow of an afternoon all the year afore. It only means a change in the weather, she said. Not what you think. Tis impossible. End of chapter thirty three.